knowledge and information. This is the theme of this year's edition of Global Access. The importance of knowledge has been evident to man since the beginning of time. But the Information Society presents new questions. How does the increasingly intense flow of information affect our ability to maintain a holistic understanding of the world? And does it actually make us smarter or dumber? Claire Lehman is the founder and editor-in-chief of the online publication Quillette, based in Australia. In a short time, Quillette has established itself as an international platform for, among other things, psychology. Its articles do not hesitate to challenge given truths on pressing topics. Claire Lehman is interviewed by Nicholas Ekdal. Uh, you left the university where you studied psychology a few years ago and uh, you founded a very successful online magazine instead, Quillette. Uh, what was the problem with higher education, as you saw it, that made you change your course? Well, it wasn't so much a problem with higher education that I saw, but I saw a problem with mainstream media in that the content that I was learning as a student of psychology wasn't really being reflected in our national broadcast media. So I became quite literate in um, some areas of scientific consensus, maybe um, issues to do with sex differences, intelligence research, uh, issues like that, which are never really discussed in media. And so I became aware that there was a gap between what I knew as a social scientist and what was being reflected. And I thought that wouldn't it be great to have an online um, magazine that filled in that gap? So the problem you identified was actually on the media side, so That's to speak, right, yeah. or, the, or the, the lack of, of something. Yeah, the lack of scient uh, rigorous scientific kind of commentary. There's a lot of commentary about different issues, but it's mostly informed by a humanities kind of uh, explanation, not a scientific explanation. Mm. particularly around social and behavioural issues, which is what I'm primarily interested in. And you've referred to the physicist uh, C.P. Snow, who yeah. articulated this schism between the science and, and the humanities yeah. in the 50s. Uh, yeah. How do you see that sort of uh, polarisation playing out today? Well, I think it still continues and I think it's gotten worse, particularly in the fields that have been affected by postmodernism and more recently um, critical theory. And what I see is that uh, there are certain meta-narratives or theories that are persistent within the humanities that have been refuted by scientific evidence, but these narratives persist. Where do you think they derive from these narratives if, um, if they're not founded, founded in, in, science, in science, so to speak? Well, it's tricky to pinpoint exactly, but uh, I've I, uh, I see a conflict theory, the sort of Marxist analysis which pits groups against each other in competition over resources. I see that as having a, a very profound influence over the way um, social phenomena is interpreted and explained. Everything is about power. Exactly. Who's oppressed and who's the oppressor. Exactly. Um, and... So if you look at social phenomena through a scientific perspective, power might be one factor, but it will just be one of many. Whereas uh, certain humanities disciplines treat power as the be all and end all, and uh, power plays a vastly outsized role in explaining certain right. phenomena. Yeah. And what's the trajectory there? You, it's even getting worse, you think? Or? Well, the, the problem is that certain fields, um, such as maybe gender studies or critical race studies or post-colonial studies, they don't um, incorporate any kind of uh, scientific data or evidence. So the, these theories continue without ever really being falsified or tested or revised. Um, so we, the situation we have is just these humanity subjects are untethered from uh, real world sort of empirical evidence. And one of the sad outcomes of that is that the humanities are becoming less prestigious and more marginalised. And then um, 
we're getting a lot of ideology. So a lot of political advocacy, ideolo ideology coming out of these disciplines, impacting things like media mm. and our political discourse and our ability to have conversations. Right, but the way you describe it now, it, 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 it seems like it's originating within academia and then spreading into the policy discussion and the media narrative, if you will. Yeah, that's my view. That's yeah. my view, yeah. And what are the consequences? If you look policy-wise, I mean, the society's ability to solve pressing problems and so on, is that hampered by this yeah. schism? Yeah, very much so, because it's really difficult to have conversations when people are coming from different epistemological positions. So if you're trained as a scientist and you want to approach a social problem by doing um, a st statistical analysis, collecting all of the data, revising your hypothesis, if the data contradicts it, it's a very different process from looking at the power dynamics involved and then trying to um, design or engineer a solution to restructure according to the power dynamics that you prefer to see. It's a, it's a, it's a very different way of um, understanding a problem and then devising a solution to a problem. And I think this um, schism we have is ham definitely hampering our discourse to even understand each other when we approach political problems. Like issues like the gender pay gap, for example, if you're trained as a psychologist or an econo economist, you'll look at a range of different variables. Uh, you know, do women have children? What do they, what careers are they involved in? What is their education? You will look at a range of different variables to understand what's really going on. However, if you're trained in a sort of conflict theory type of discipline, your immediate approach will be to um, try and socially engineer that pay gap away without fully understanding all of the complex variables that might, might be causing it in the first place. Mm. And is there a fix to this problem? I mean, which side should, should the, the humanities adjust to the methods of natural science? That's what you're saying? Or? Well, it would be ideal and great if they did, but I mean, these issues have been going on for a long time and they haven't gotten any better. Um, I think what we're seeing, though, is a, a retreat from, you know, the humanities, are, they do, they're, are, they're quite powerful, but we're seeing fewer students enrol in these courses and more students are seeing that to get, um, you know, prestigious careers that are well paid, they have to go into more quantitative fields, more rigorous fields. So there is a decline. Um, and I think that there are certain signs that universities are going to be disrupted by online courses. Um, internet sort of movements uh, seem to be becoming more and more popular that offer alternative explanations to some of these tricky problems. So it's um, a real crisis you're describing for the humanities, right? That's On right. many yeah, dif different yeah, levels. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. And, and the technological uh, advancement is sort of creating an overdrive on this ideological problem, if you will. Yeah, so the, yeah, the issue is that certain segments of the humanities, and I would not say all of the humanities, they've been captured by ad activists, basically, and we don't know how to get the institutions back from the activists who have captured these sections of the academy. All we know how to do is maybe disrupt an offer alternatives. So my magazine tries to offer an alternative for some of these discussions that we can't have in the university campus anymore. Um, and you've, we've seen the rise of um, YouTube channels um, created by professors such as Professor Jordan Peterson in Canada. They are extremely popular. We're seeing the rise of podcasts. History podcasts are extremely popular. So there's a great demand for classical liberal education. Um, and I think that demand is coming from the fact that universities are not really providing that classical liberal education anymore and are instead offering up schools in activism. Right, and not only universities, it goes for primary school as well, I think? Or yeah, yeah, I mean, it varies according to region and I think some regions have 
the, the curriculum is much more politicised than others. But we're seeing that in Australia. I went to see my old English teacher at my old high school and he said that he doesn't teach English anymore because the curriculum demanded that he teach texts in the final year of high school, either through a Marxist lens, a feminist lens, or a post-colonial lens. Um, and this is just a politicization of education. You know, it's, um, it didn't used to be like that. You were, were able to teach texts according to um, their literary merits and look at themes and, um, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the, the style and prose and the artistic merit but now everything has to be through a political lens. And, um, yeah. So that, but that's basically an ideological issue you're describing. It's not really about science. or. Yeah, yeah. But so it, it, ma it makes... If your education has been influenced by these ideological perspectives, it makes it very hard to come to the table and have discussions with people who have gone through a different type of education um, where there is very little ideology and it's all about actually trying to understand the problem and solve the problem. So we're getting groups of people who are both educated and have gone through university systems but who cannot understand each other. Because you get very different toolkits exactly. in the humanities and yeah. in the natural sciences. Yeah. Uh, but how can that be adjusted? What's the solution then? I don't have a solution myself. Um, I would say the universities have, um, have a serious problem on their hands and that our political discourse and conversation is suffering because there is too much ideology and, and um, education is too impacted by these politicised departments. Um, I think the only real solution is a free market solution and for there to be new institutions coming through, online universities, online liberal arts courses, so that students can choose not to go to universities that are politicised and can choose to uh, go to alternative institutions. I think that's the only way forward. Mm. Yeah. But we also have a sort of broader polarisation in Western society where we have the cosmopolitans, experts, financial winners on one side and the more rooted people on the other side. People often lose out from globalisation and so on. Uh, and this narrative that you described, the, 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 the academics, if you will, they are, aren't they all on the same side in this broader uh, conflict within Western society? Yeah, that's right. And I, but I think that the politicization of certain fields probably makes that polarization worse. Right, because it's hard to come to grips with reality. Re exactly, so. yeah. And the, these, these theories become ever more abstract and sort of based on fantasy and are not dealing with the actual problems that need to be solved. Um, They're also a bit like loaded guns in, in the hands of someone who doesn't really have the big picture, if yeah, you will. Yeah, right. I mean, all of this uh, focus on, uh, you know, fi uh, the, the you know, fixing the gender distribution of corporate boards, you know, um, these issues that are affecting only middle to upper class people uh, are really, you know, it's alienating for, for working class or blue collar people to constantly hear about these problems that do not affect them. Is that how you interpret uh, the Trump phenomenon and Brexit phenomenon and stuff like that, that this is a crucial part of, of, of that, the conflict that brought these things about? I think there's a certain um, self so I think elites are becoming, uh, you know, divorced. The cognitive elite are becoming less in touch with everybody else. And the problems that they focus on are their own problems that they um, have either created or are um, sort of fixated onto an over, you know, um, to, a, to an extent that is probably not worthwhile. Right. And there are many who even fear for enlightenment 
itself and democracy yeah. these yeah. days. I mean, if you look at autocrats in China, Russia, and Turkey, they are full of confidence, whereas democracy seems rather dysfunctional, if yeah. you will. Yeah. Uh, how does that uh, relate to, to this academic sclerosis that you describe, if you will? Well, it, the, there are real problems in our democracies that need to be solved, and we need to talk about difficult issues. And if we have politicised departments where scholars are not dealing with the real problems that we face, we're not getting the ideas and solutions that we need. So we, it's, it's sort of like an opportunity cost. If we're focusing on the wrong problems and all of our attention is going into, you know, microaggressions or, um, you know, how... how how sexist, you know, films are instead of real problems to do with uh, participatory democracy, then we're, we're wasting our resources, we're wasting our talent, we're wasting opportunities to actually deal with and fix problems. Mm. Mm. So all these problems are somehow connected, as you see it. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Mm. Uh, so you founded this online magazine, Killette. Mm -hmm. What was the plan? Did it turn out as you had planned it from the beginning? Or um, what has been the reactions to that sort of scientific essays in psychology, political science and so on that you well, published? There was a market straight away. So we had an audience straight, like from day one. Um, and there's been incredible demand for rigorous, analytical, um, rational debate. Did you know that or were you surprised by the reception? Uh, I, I knew it because I couldn't see it being offered, but I have been surprised at how many people really enjoy long form articles and really enjoy like a very high quality um, sort of scholarly um, essay style. That has been a surprise to me, um, but I knew people were looking for scientifically literate um, discussion of sensitive topics and sometimes controversial and taboo topics as well. Um, and so it's, yeah, our growth just keeps sort of going up in a straight line and we haven't really plateaued yet. So there is incredible demand for this. And what um, sort of topic has created the, the greatest stir, if you will? Could you give us some examples of, of things you've published? I know there's stuff on on gender, on uh, child, child, child development, yeah. uh, the use of uh, drugs in mental care and stuff like that. Yeah, so we became uh, quite well known overnight when um, James Damore was fired from his job in Google because um, I published for scientists' uh, um, opinions on what he had written in the memo that he was fired for. So I published a neuroscientist, a social psychologist, an evolutionary psychologist. And, and the memo the, he was fired for, could you describe the that? The memo he was fired for argued that it was unrealistic to see 50-50 representation of men and women in engineering roles in Google because women, men and women are not exactly the same. We have sex differences in our interests and occupations. Um, we have sex differences in our personalities. Um, that we have many things the same, but there are important differences and these can be reflected in um, occupations and... On the statistic collective level, so to speak. On the average level. Yeah, and then it was, and fired, he, it was he, fired. Yeah, and he made it very clear that he was not talking about individuals and he was talking only in terms of averages. And he even... Um, specified that if we are taking the wrong steps to equalise the workplace, then there might be backfire effects and that kind of thing, and we might be wasting resources and there might be better interventions we can so, And use. in your eyes, it was a fairly reasonable argument? Or? Well, I published four different scientists, and they didn't all agree with him and each other, but they did point out that it, he, the memo had reasonable arguments and it, it, the memo that he put forward would have been a reasonable thing to um, submit in any kind of uh, psychology class, for example. Um, the evidence that he talked about is all peer-reviewed published 
evidence in the behavioral sciences. And statistics that are out there. Um, exactly. Um, so he was fired and this was quite a shock. And so we published our article before he was fired, then he was fired and um, it, it sort of went viral because we were the first to um, demonstrate that no, his arguments actually had some basis in evidence, uh, solid evidence and, um, you know, it, the issue became very controversial and so we were at the centre of it. Right, and that's the sort of slightly contrarian things that you run. Yeah. Do, do you ever run a risk, you think, of, of, of ending up in a sort of an echo cham chamber of your own in that sense? Um, I suppose so. We try hard to mitigate against that and we try hard to publish debates so where people with serious opinions disagree with each other and I invite... If we publish a polarising article, I will always invite people to respond to it and I rarely ever decline anyone if they want to respond to an article that I have published. So my, our editorial position is to let readers decide for themselves and we always run the risk of having a bias um, but we, 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 try, we do have ways to mitigate against that. And how does that work out? Is it a polite, constructive tone to it, or yeah. can it go go bad, go bad, badly sometimes? We avoid publishing polemics, and although our content can be controversial, it is not ever intended to be provocative. Um, we on, we only publish essays and articles that have a measured, balanced tone. Um, and you don't have commentary fields where anyone can log in and comment? Uh, yeah, people can make comments, but our comments are very well known for being quite civilised right. and people do not call each other names and that kind of thing. So we have a, a very um, high level of discourse. Right. Yeah, yeah. that's encouraging because things often... Deteriorate. Yeah, yeah. deteriorate online. Yeah. Right. You also have described how you felt sort of constrained as a journalist and increasingly cynical about the university uh, system. Uh, again, could you describe what was the core of the problem? And if you look ahead, I mean, if it can be fixed somehow, these, these problems. Oh, I always go back to scientific training. And unfortunately... Uh, a lot of journalists and people who have high profiles in media and who sort of steer discourse into certain directions simply do not have the, the toolkit that one has to make sort of intricate, rational, evidence-based arguments. And I, I honestly see the media as playing a, a role in in some of our polarisation and our problems because um, certain narratives are offered up which cannot be falsified because they're unfalsifiable. Narratives are offered up even in the face of disconfirming evidence that we have in the scientific fields. And it just creates this, uh, an environment where if you cannot disconfirm a narrative, then it becomes dogma. And what do you do with dogma? You can't, you can't really do anything. And, and it becomes this political situation where you've got dogmas and, and unfalsifiable narratives being presented over and over again. And the it, conversation breaks down. Mm. And many of the things we've talked about uh, would, could be just described as political correctness, I suppose. That's a popular term. Yeah. How would you describe that concept? What is political correctness to you? Well, it's, um, you know, it's, it's a type of dogma. So a, a, a good way of describing the political correctness that we are living the through... The dogma of decency, if you will. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think a good way of describing it is um, the life cycle of a revolution. So the civil rights movements in the 1960s were a revolution and we uh, became aware of the need for gender equality, racial equality, and all of um, these ex extremely important sort of enlightenment principles. So there was a revolution that took place. What we're going through now is sort of the, the period in which the revolution has passed and the principles that were once um, li uh, liberated, 
liberated people have become ossified and sort of they've, they've turned into dogmas now. If you compare it to the French Revolution, we're sort of in the face where heads start to roll because exactly. you're not stern enough or something like that. Exactly. Yeah, and so what happens is the revolutionaries become the tyrants and it's the life cycle of a revolution. So the, the principles that once animated the civil rights movement have now turned into dogmas and people who are sort of... Um, pushing those dogmas, they're becoming more and more authoritarian in the way in which they want to enforce them. And that's how I see political correctness, yeah. Yeah, but isn't this a sort of dialectic process where you have waves and, and so this one will also run its course in a way, or? Oh, I can't predict the future, I hope it does, I, I hope it does. And, and I think the, the key um, mitigating factor will be the internet and how technology allows us to communicate freely mm -hmm. uh, without censorship and... Um, but that goes to the core of your publishing idea in a way, yeah, to, yeah. to try and mitigate uh, these forces. Yeah, yeah. And if people want to uh, look up your website or uh, support it even, what should they do? Well, we're at quillette.com, Q-U-I-L-L-E-T-E.com. Uh, we're entirely um, based on reader donations. Our funding model is entirely based on donations and we have a Patreon account. And uh, you can also subscribe to our newsletter, our weekly newsletter. Right, so you have great freedom. You're, you're it's sort of a crowd-funded crowd op operation. So we're completely independent. Yeah. No, no big owners who sort of, sort of try and call the shots or anything? Nothing like that, yeah. Okay. Uh, which of these issues that we discuss today are the, the thorniest, do you think, uh, that, that are taboos in, in Western society? Well, gender difference is, is, a, is a big one, is a huge one, and it's one that I've um, written about and talked about a lot. Um, but it's, it's, it, the issue really is how do we deal with groups of people having different outcomes and how do we explain that? And so the conflict theory perspective is that if groups have different outcomes, that's because one group is exploiting another. The scientific perspective will be, it's actually really complicated and we have to run an analysis to find out. Um, so the, the, the thorniest issues that I see is how do we talk about groups of people having different outcomes, educational outcomes, earning outcomes, health outcomes. Migration is one of those issues. Absolutely. How do we talk about that in an open and honest manner? Um, because it is sensitive, um, but without getting bogged down in this, comp this, this idea that all of the, it's all exploitation and it's all oppression. That's, that's right. what I see, yeah. All right, thank you so much. No Kelly. problem, thank you. Thanks.